Yeah, yeah, go on. Good. Okay, so um, welcome to everyone uh, who joined this evening. Um, uh, Wednesday FRCS teaching from the FRCS mentor group. Uh, tonight from the group we have Shwan, Athar, um, and myself. But the main presenter is uh, Ramesh. He's taken on a huge task of uh, summarizing the latest uh, 14th uh, report of the NGR of 2017. It's a large document, over 200 pages. So he's kindly um, offered to present that. It's a very important topic. It can come in the adult pathology. Um, and also, as we saw last week in the statistics, it could come um, as a funnel plot um, question in the statistics section, but it is, also very important to understand the details of the NGR because you could use the data there to support your, your evidence and your answers in, in various questions and score higher marks. So uh, with that and due delay, I'll uh, leave it to uh, Ramesh to start. Hi guys. Um, Hi Ramesh. So, uh, I think most of you are fresh following David's talk on the statistics. So I'm I think you guys know more about kaplan meier analysis than me. Uh, so I don't need to get into that. So that's out of the way. That saves my job. Uh, again, uh, customary disclosure. Basically, these are my views and my understanding of the document. It doesn't represent anybody else. Uh, right. So this was back in 1972. This was a statement by John Charlie. Uh, it is one of his uh, internal publications where he was the first of kind to talk about a central register to keep an eye on all the joint placements and how they're being done by who and if they're being followed up regularly or not. And that was the first mention uh, historically, just so you know. And this is a timeline um, of various registers uh, which have uh, come up. So the oldest is uh, the Swedish knee registry, goes all the way to 1975. And then the hip registry from Sweden and uh, the England and Wales, although it is, it says 2003, it was started uh, as a steering group in 2002, but they started collecting data only in 2003. Right, so now, uh, what are the goals? So NGR has, has, has it's, all, it's all on the website, so you can read through later. I'm not gonna read all the lines mentioned on this uh, slide. But essentially, uh, they're looking at uh, real-time uh, monitoring of the data and uh, basically to detect uh, if there are any early failures. Uh, with the experience from 3M Capital Hip and uh, Metal on Metal uh, Fiasco, uh, they are now trying to catch early failures so that there is the patients don't undergo undue surgery and then having to have repeated uh, revisions. <laughs> the other thing they need to, uh, the other goal is to monitor the various different practices. It's a big country, obviously. The different surgeons having their own priorities and the way they do things. This is my way of doing things. So it gives us an opportunity to, to monitor the various different practices and, and easily identify an outlier uh, compared to the rest of the country. Uh, the other thing is um, end user awareness. Basically, it's putting the data out on um, on open platform gives an opportunity for the patients to look at the data and understand what they're getting into. And they can actually look up individual trust and individual consultant outcomes as well. So it's quite helpful for the patient groups. And uh, this also gives us uh, gives them an opportunity to, to negotiate with the companies so that they can have cost-effective supply chain and procurement of the implants. And of course, um, it's also uh, post-sales feedback for the for the companies and and all the users and the and the patients as well. Right. So, getting straight into hip replacement, this particular slide. Um, this could be a starting point to to various things. They can get into uh, as straightforward as statistics, although not straightforward, but it could lead into statistics. It could lead into um, a basic sciences section where they'll talk, talk to you about poly, metal, the profiles, crash profile of ceramics and various things. And it could also take you into, into clinical problems and how do you select an implant. 
So the, the summary of, of NJR will help you in selecting the right. It will tell you the, the, the probability of survival of any implant, but it's, it's your higher or high, high order thinking that will that'll enable you to decide what is best for each patient. Just because uh, ceramic and poly has got the best outcome doesn't mean that you will do ceramic and poly for all patients. So this is just numbers and you can use this to, uh, to facilitate your know, patient care and things. Um, so looking at the cemented um, uh, total hip replacement, it, is, it has been a workhorse uh, so to, for, uh, for surgeons for many years now. Um, and uh, looking at the, the, the latest outcome is, is 13 years now for the NGR that they have been publishing the reports. It's 4.25 for 13 years. And uh, looking at metal on metal, you know, it's, it's nearly gone out of fashion now because of high failure rates and lots of other problems. It's nearly 19% to 20%, uh, depending on the age group. And uh, for others where they're not sure whether they have put in a cemented hybrid reverse hybrid where it has not been entered into the, uh, into the NGR form, then they, they constitute about 5% uh, uh, of failure rate over 13 years. This is a busy slide, and there is a, there's a lot of information in this. I think the main thing you need to concentrate on are the, on this, this particular column here and down at the bottom, which is the 13-year outcome, okay? And for the previous one for, uh, was for cemented, and this is for uh, uncemented and hybrid implants. Um, if you look at uncemented metal on poly, for some reason, the outcome is 5.9, percent uh, probability of uh, revision at 13 years whereas um, in the cemented uh, uh, metal and poly it was just over four percent the other thing is uh, metal and metal if you're doing an uncemented it's more than 20 percent ceramic and poly which is quite good it's come down to same as metal and poly for the cemented and there was a fashion to use um, hard and hard bearing in the form of ceramic and metal but i think that's gone into disrepute now and there's no long-term data on that, uh, obviously, because it's, it's been, it's not been used for a long time for many citizens. Um, hybrid, uh, if you look at the, the percentage-wise, the, the use of hybrid total hip replacements has increased over the last few years. Uh, although uncemented uh, hip replacement is still the highest number in terms of percentage uh, of use in the country, but the hybrid is slowly picking up. Uh, metal on poly has got a fantastic um, uh, just a standard uh, metal on poly 4.9 percent if you're doing metal on metal hybrid uh, which not many people do it is 19 percent and the best thing obviously is ceramic and ceramic which is less than three less than four percent is three and a half percent nearly so these are the graphs you will you, you're all experts in this you have seen david's presentation i don't need to explain what's what's involved in all this but uh, the main thing is um, used to look at the outcomes in less than 55 years. And that's, that's the key thing, really, because this is, this is the group where you will struggle to decide what is the best form of treatment for these patients, whether is it, is it a, a joint preserving surgery or a joint replacement surgery or partial joint replacement surgery, based on which joint you're dealing with. Um, so this is inclusive of metal on metal as well, uh, this particular chart. Uh, where, where you see that less than 55 years, the, the failure rate is pretty high. It goes up to 7% in 13 years. And this particular graph is, I beg your pardon, I think uh, this is the one without the metal on metal, without the metal on metal, where it is less than 7%. And uh, this is the one with the metal on metal hip replacements, where you see that in females, if they're less than 15, if they're less than 55, the failure rate is pretty high. And there was a time when they stopped making metal on metal for a size less than 44 or something like that. And that was the initial bit. And then it went into total disrepute uh, and people stopped using it for female patients anyway in that age group. Um, there are very few surgeons who still do um, metal on metal hip replacements, but in a, in a correctly chosen patient, it does give good benefits uh, over the standard hip replacements. replacements. So 
an all-important head size. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware of the the Livermore uh, study of uh, wear rates, volumetric wear rates, and linear wear rates. Um, the main thing is uh, this, part, this doesn't tell you whether you're using a standard polyethylene or an ultra high molecular polyethylene. And there is no differentiation in the NGR among these. There are other papers which, which tell you that the high density, high, highly cross linked polyethylene has got better outcomes, but the NGR doesn't differentiate between them. So you'll have to take this data with a pinch of salt, uh, or as it is rather, uh, without reading too much into it. Um, so if you're looking at, uh, again, a busy slide, obviously, uh, that's how most of the graphs in NGR, it's very difficult to try and break it down into anything simple. Um, so let's look at um, 32 for the, for the matter, 32 in a metal and poly cemented. And that seems to be, uh, in the place I work at least, uh, uh, sort of, you know, pretty standard size, uh, that is 32 in uh, metal and poly cemented. And that's the chart there. You see that there is an initial sort of um, increased slope there, but then it's sort of steadily studies itself for a period of time. And if you're looking at 13%, it's, it's just a four, just a 13 years is just a 4%. But if you're looking at this uh, purple one, whatever that color is, um, purple one, and then it keeps, keeps going up. And for 28 head, which is yellow in color, again, it, it shows a steady sort of survival. And uh, for 13 years, it's again, just short of 4%. So it's pretty good. Again, you have to understand it is not a differentiation between the kind of polyethylene that is used. It's just the size of the head and its survival. So in uncemented, it's slightly different. Uh, so this particular green line is the size for 44. And we know that if you get into bigger head size, more than 36, uh, then or even 40, then you start getting higher volumetric wear, and then it's not so commonly used, and that basically is uh, is not commonly used these days. Um, looking at uh, common, most common size, 28 and 32, 28 is uh, that orangish color, just pretty steady there for that color. For 13 years, you're just approaching 5%, slightly over 5%. And for 36, uh, 32, which is purple in color, again, it keeps going up, and uh, when it reaches more than 11 years, the survival just goes up, uh, goes down a bit, which means the probability of revision goes up a bit, more than 5%. And uh, metal on metal, uh, uncemented, very busy slide, obviously, various sizes, the biggest sizes, but I don't think we need to get into the details of these things because not many, not many people. I think more, most of the questions for metal on metal will be related to MHRA guidance and and uh, Alval and, and all the rest of it related to that, rather than the NGR results. Uh, ceramic and poly uh, for cemented. We know that ceramic and poly gives very good results for a cemented hip replacement. If you look at the size of the head, uh, 36, which is green. Uh, gray in color there again not many people seems to be using it because it seems to be stopping there at eight or nine years looking at the 32 which is purple or whatever the color is and uh, it's, it's basically seems to be giving a, a steady sort of uh, uh, two percent or just over two percent probability of revision at 13 years which is quite good and uh, 28 again has got a steady slope increasing. And as the years go by, there is a little bit more. Although compared to the other um, liners, this seems to be giving the best result. And most of us know that anyway. Ceramic and poly for uncemented. Um, so three sizes, 28, 32, and 36. And uh, for 32, it's going up there. And if you're using a 28 ceramic, ceramic and poly in uncemented, it seems to be a steady increase in the wear rate. It's going up. As the size increases, I think there are papers which show that up to 36, uh, the ceramic and poly gives the very good results. Beyond that, it seems to cause problems. 
obviously you can make the poly only so thin because it also depends on the size of the establum or the establer cup that you're putting in. So ceramic on ceramic and cemented. Um, 28 head, you see that it is steadily increasing and it goes up to nearly five and a half to six percent for 13 years. Uh, 32 head, it's just just short of four percent, which is pretty good. I think ceramic and ceramic for uncemented is better than uh, uh, most of the others, uh, other liners that you use. So, uncemented is still the most common, but hybrid is catching up. Sorry. To summarize, the cumulative probability for a revision of a total replacement is about six point eight percent. For a cemented hip, it is 4.3. And the best in cemented is ceramic and poly, which is just short of 4%. For a hybrid fixation, although the overall percentage is more than cemented, the ceramic and ceramic for a hybrid is the best one, 3.3%. And in an uncemented, ceramic and poly is about 4.5%. Um, so that's that's basically about uh, hip replacement uh, from NGR. Looking at age and sex, uh, if you're if the patient is uh, female and less than fifty five, the risk is thirteen point five thirteen point five percent. So this is this is a group you should think of. Are you does the patient really need a hip replacement, or do you want to be uh, waiting for some more time? And and ceramic and poly, if you have to do it, gives the best result for these patients is about 3.8 percent at 10 years. In a male patient it is slightly low and uh, best is cemented ceramic compoly. So I think it's it's if your patient in the exam or in the discussion is 55 to 60 years you'll have to think what is the best um, uh, bearing material that you're using and what is the size of head. If somebody is, is more than 75 and if, if they have a hip replacement after 75 it's very unlikely that they're going to need a revision in their lifetime. So that's the key thing. If it is less than 55, 60, you have to think hard if you're doing the right operation for this patient. If somebody is more than 75 and they need a hip replacement, then we're very unlikely to need the revision in their lifetime. So that's a pretty good general rule that you can remember in your practice and for the exam. So same summary, resurfacing metal on metal, 14 person at 10 years, that's a lot of, uh, 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 lot of risk of uh, having revision. Stemmed metal on metal, uh, fortunately not, I don't think anybody's doing it, but when they did it, it was 27 person at 10 years, which is pretty high. And uh, surprising how they got away for that long uh, without having uh, somebody looking into it. Um, the best performing metal on metals, uh, there are only two, co two companies I think that make uh, and the best performing ones are eight to nine percent. Okay, so there is a trend to do hip replacements in a fraction of female patients if they meet a certain criteria. They seem to have similar revision rates, although people do worry about dislocation, but if due care and attention is given to the repair of the structures and the orientation of the cup and size of the head, it has got similar rates. Uh, but as we know, uh, Fraction of femur in that age group is a significant injury and they do carry high mortality like any other patients of fraction of femur, whether they have a hemi or a, or a total hip replacement. So the most common indication is uh, aseptic loosening and pain. That's uh, if you have a total hip replacement after, uh, after a uh, fraction of femur. Within the first year of THR, the cause of revision is usually dislocation and infection and fracture. In the long run, it's usually loosening and infection. If you have to do a revision, the re-revision rates uh, for 13 years is about 17%, which is quite significant. So going on to uh, knee replacement. Again, more charts. Uh, I'm afraid this, this talk is going to be full of these, these uh, Kaplan Meier charts. To simplify, um, this is the data that I've concluded, which is quite useful if you if they ask you uh, why, what implants are you, are you using and, and why are you using your implant? 
Uh, these are the most commonly used implants. I'm sure some people use others, which are not very familiar with, but these are the common implants that is used. And they, this does not, this particular on the right side, this percentage does not differentiate between whether you're doing a cruciate retaining or a cruciate substituting or a rotating platform. It's just a general thing. So the PFC uh, workhorse for many surgeons uh, gives you the best results. Uh, it doesn't specify whether it is uh, cruciate substituting or cruciate retaining. It's just over 3%. Zimmer Next Gen is 4.5%. Uh, Scorpio Striker gives you the, the highest probability of revision at 13 years, which is 5.44. Uh, and uh, Triathlon, Genesis, Vanguard, more or less in the same uh, ballpark area. Uh, and they are sort of showing promising results compared to uh, the standard PFC that most people use. Um, so the commonest. Um, Commonest is is a cruciate retaining. Is to, I think it's over sixty percent of the of the surgeons use cruciate retaining, and uh, and uh, rest is obviously cruciate uh, sacrificing posterior stabilized implants. Um, again, under fifty five is a very common problem. Young young arthritic knees. Um, so you have to decide what surgery you're doing, why you're doing, because if you end up doing a total knee replacement, the risk of revision is is pretty high, twelve percent. Uh, much more than uh, a standard knee replacement in a 70-year-old. Um, uncemented hybrid, very limited people. I think only 2% of the population use it. Uh, Unicondylar, again, another hot topic. Um, so the Oxford partially gives you about 15% uh, risk of re revision at 13 years. And A1, which is uh, the PFJ, which is commonly used, uh, gives you the risk of revision in 13 years. Is twenty percent. It's quite high. So these are, uh, although there is there is a lot of um, a talk from the Oxford group about this. You still have to think why you're doing a partial knee replacement uh, as opposed to other joint preserving or a full total knee replacement. Okay. Uh, for unicondylar knee, I think uh, as you see, under fifty five goes up pretty high, more than twenty. So again, busy slide. The reason why you have to do a uh, revision for a, for, a, for a total knee replacement, the most common, as highlighted by the red, is infection and aseptic loosening. And for unicondyla, it is persisting pain, aseptic loosening, and other causes, which is usually progression of arthritis. So in a nutshell, uh, CR is 60%, PS is 19.8%, uh, putler femoral is 1.1% of the total operations that is done. Uh, cemented total knee 4.2, unicondylar 16, PFJ 24.2 in 13 years. Uh, aseptic loosening, pain, infection are the common reasons for revision, and if you end up doing revision, it's similar to total hip replacement, is about 16%. So, moving on to the shoulder. Um, so, I'll try and I think we are running out of time, so I'll try and keep it as quick as possible. The data is only limited, it's only four years, but there is enough papers um, on many many of these journals which gives you the 10 year results, even 12, 12 year results of uh, total shoulder replacement. Um, so it can be done for primarily elective procedure or trauma, uh, hemiarthroplasty or reverse can be done for, uh, uh, for a trauma situation and uh, total shoulder in the elective situation for an intact calf. Uh, so less than 65 years in males, the revision is 7.6%, although this is only a four-year data, and in females, it's about 6.4%. Moving on, um, so in four years, if you if you have done a humeral um, hemiarthroplasty in four years, there's a 5% risk of revision, a failure of it, and if you're doing a, a reversed uh, total, it's about 4% in four years. So that's just about, about uh, hip replacement, basically. Um, elbow, again, limited data. In a few years, uh, you're looking at uh, either a total elbow or radialite replacements. And uh, for three years, it's only about 2 or 3% of risk of revision. Again, indication for revision. Ankle replacement, limited data, six years. Uncemented is pretty common, 88%. And uh, revision is 7%, 7.7% 7, 7 at six years. Okay. 
Um, so what are the problems with NGR data? Um, we know it's not a randomized control study. We know it's an observational study. It's just a collection of patients. Now, we sh it has shown a lot of significance in, in statistical, because there's huge numbers, you can get statistical significance. But what we don't know is, is it clinically relevant? It's only an observational data, so you're not comparing like to like. You're just pulling everybody together and writing up papers. Uh, what we don't know is it only shows, shows association between it causal. It, it doesn't tell you that it is because of that, but it shows you that these are, these are commonly occurring coexisting problems. There's uh, reporting bias because most of us are um, sometimes can be guilty of forgetting to write your NGF form, but we end up writing it anyway. Um, then there is selection bias. You know that you will give a ceramic and poly to a younger patient or ceramic and ceramic to a younger patient as opposed to an older patient. You give uncemented to a younger patient as opposed to an older patient. So there is selection bias as well. And there is lack of clear stratification. So you don't, you don't stratify or, or you don't basically consider how you have arrived at the decision. You just look at the end decision of the bearings. Um, and revision as an endpoint can be sometimes spurious because you see so many of these patients who have problems with their joint replacement, but they don't want to consider the surgery because they have issues with medical issues, social issues, this and that. So if you're looking at revision as an endpoint, um, then you are likely to get vitally mixed results. Uh, but it's still a big population of patients uh, being studied. I think it's, it's pretty good. Uh, so these are my references. Uh, the only other thing is to highlight this particular paper. I think this was in 2012. Uh, so this was one of the attempts to link the patient reported outcomes to NJR data. And that's, I think, the way forward. It will tell, um, tell you not just the statistically significant things, but also clinically significant things. And this particular paper is about um, total versus unicondylar replacement. Although there's there's a lot of lot of um, chatter about unicondylar replacement, this puts things into perspective to some extent. Um, it's just one paper. I'm not saying this will tell you everything that you need to know, but it also basically tells you that there's no clinically significant difference, and there is no one of the arguments is that the unicondylar patients get um, sort of uh, better Oxford scores. scores uh, compared to total knee replacement. But this, this study did not find that better Oxford score in, uh, in a uniform knee replacement. Okay, I think we breezed through quite a few things. Um, it's, a, it's a huge document. You just have to consider from your exam point of view, what are we going to use it for? You cannot re you can read the whole thing when you have time, but I think you're essentially looking at your outcomes of your bearings in the, in the hip replacement. Because that's the key thing, really. That's what you will be quizzed on most. And of course, you need to understand the, the, the graph. I haven't included the outlier graphs and this and funnel plots and things, but I think it just gets too much. I think maybe we, if there is a need, we can consider doing a separate uh, statistics. I, I'm not sure. I haven't watched David's webinar. I'm not sure if he's covered all of those things in there. It was covered. Thank you, Amish. That was really amazing. I just wish. Um... There was such a presentation when I was preparing for my exam. You really managed to get a lot of data. The whole document is, is full of data. Yeah, it's, it's all data. It's very difficult to summarize that data. Uh, but I like how you presented the tables and how at the end you, you summarized everything to recap. And, um, mm -hmm. and that's really great. And, mm -hmm. and as you said, it's, it is very important to remember those points Ramesh highlighted. So you can back up your answers, particularly in a more tricky situation when the examiner asks you about a young patient, how you're going to inform them about the risk of revision. And then if you tell them NGR data, tell us so and so, you, you, will, you will impress the examiner. Uh, so it's very interesting also to, to, to see that cemented total hip replacement is still the best performing implant, implant in um, hip replacement, more. cemented type. And, uh, uh, it's a lot of useful information there from, you know, from our head sizes and um, various um, um, bi biomaterials used. It's really very useful. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Ramesh. That was a um, really top presentation. Uh, I'll try to keep it up. So if you don't... Uh, uh, only have a few seconds left. Sorry to interrupt you, but... Uh, no, no, I appreciate that. Sorry. Yeah, it's just, the, the, it's the it's worth showing that in the statistics. But. Thank you, everyone, particularly uh, Ramesh. 
price crash. I'm sure this took you a long time, many hours to summarize this. And um, it will be yeah. recorded and everyone, I'm sure, will, will go through it in their very details to, 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 to find the best answer for the exam. We have 36 people attended today, which is amazing from all over um, um, the world, really. And um, this will be followed by hot seat session, which uh, Shwan is kindly going to um, host. And um, he will be joined by other mentors. I apologize. I have other commitments tonight, but I, I promise I will join uh, and uh, help with the future hot seat session. That's, that's not good. <laughs> I know. I know. You're slacking. No, not, really, not really, but I really have you. Okay, so okay, thank you very much, guys. Good. Luck. And we will answer about uh, about someone ask about how will okay. how we are going to be tested in such an issue. I will answer that following we we rejoin for the hot seat. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir.